Our first speaker, Dr. John Quinn, who's already taken the stand there. He's from Newar in Hamilton. He's the chief scientist. And wherever I think about John, I think about rivers and streams, and I'll see whether he's going to prove me right. Over to you, John. Kia ora kato. Thank you, Bruce. So we've got a session on freshwater restoration this morning, and I'm going to kick it off talking about challenges and opportunities. So just to start off with just reminding you about what our freshwaters are. We, New Zealand is blessed with pretty amazing freshwater ecosystems. We have groundwaters that uh, we'll be hearing more from Graham Fenwick a bit later in the session about, which feed into wetlands, which we've done a very good job of getting rid of, uh, draining for farmland. Uh, we're down to about 13% of the original extent, and Bev Clarkson will be talking about their restoration a bit later on. We have an amazing diversity of rivers and streams in this country, and I'll be focusing a little bit more on those in this overview talk. Uh, Susie Woods will be talking about lakes, so streams flow to lakes and lakes flow to estuaries, and we've got about 300 of those. So we have a very rich resource of fresh waters in New Zealand. And for Māori, fresh waters have always been incredibly important for their culture. They, uh, a lot of the species that you see in this view graph are taonga to them. They had a, a whole rich technology about how, how to use these resources. Um, and some of those technologies have been picked up and, and used be, be, as, as monitoring tools now. And uh, there'll be a bit of a, a talk about that later today as well. Murray, um, and the treaty sediment process has created a lot of opportunity for freshwater restoration. Indeed, it's driven a lot of what we've been doing in the last decade uh, with freshwater restoration. Murray gives us a language for Pākehā to actually be able to talk about relationships with water in a different ways that, that comes from our Anglo-Saxon background. So um, Māori's contribution to freshwater and their history in it, and I sh you know, should say, guess going back there, that Sir Tiffany O'Regan referred to freshwater as, as the hinge of Māori heritage, particularly for those iwi who have been disenfranchised from their lands. Their ability to continue to develop their cultural practices with water have been really important to maintaining their culture. Freshwaters are also a really important resource for New Zealand providing so much of our renewable energy, water for agriculture, for our drinking, for our industries, resources for building, um, places where, that assimilate the, the, what, the waste that come from, from, our, uh, from our lands and, and the runoff from, from our systems and drainage, but also really important for uh, recreation and for tourism. There's a lot of concern in the public about fresh waters. This is, uh, Ken Huey and his colleagues do a survey every three years about what is the most important environmental issue to the public for over a decade, and it just seems to get more, impo more important every time he does the survey, it's around fresh water. And it's because of those reasons that are outlaid there. Waters are so important to us for so many ways about our identity and as social economic systems. The need for freshwater restoration is very clear. There have been some quite uh, compelling reports released in the last couple of months from the, the Chief Science Advisor to the Prime Minister from Ministry of Environment and, and, and Ministry of, St St of Statistics. And the government has been responding to the uh, plight of our fresh waters um, with the National Policy Statement for Fresh Water that came out in 2011. 2014, there was uh, the uh, National Objectives Framework which, which introduced limits setting and uh, as a way of trying to stop the, the sort of progressive degradation of fresh waters by having regional councils set limits for what they wanted in fresh waters and working back to what you could do in catchments to meet those limits. And there's ongoing discussion with the recent clean water discussion document has just come out. So what's the current state? Um, this is looking some, uh, some data that I've reworked from Scott Larned's paper published last year, looking at the uh, water quality in relation to land cover from about 1,000 sites that have been monitored over the last decade by uh, various um, regional councils in Niwa. And what we see is a general degradation as we go across from natural cover to exotic forest, to pastoral farming, to urban. Across the, the MCI, there's a macro invertebrate community index which tells us a bit about the overall stream health, looking at the insects that live in the stream bed. But the nutrients, the water clarity, the E. coli, all tell a similar story. Um, the red lines there are of various guidelines for bathing quality. You can see our pastoral streams and our urban streams are not below those bottom lines. Looking at the trends, though, over that time period, for those sites, what we see is that the sites on the, the left hand, the, the things on the left hand side of this graph that tend to move into, from the land into the water uh, from pipes uh, and surface runoff and from animals having access to streams, there'll be more sites actually improving than degrading in the last decade. 
However, nitrate that goes through the groundwater has a longer legacy, is more difficult to control at the edge of the field. There's been more sites getting worse than better. And if we look at the macroinvertebrates, there's not so much data available for those for doing trends over time, but again, more sites getting worse than better. And some of those are likely due to constraints for connectivity for species getting back in places where the habitat's been improved, but they, haven't, they aren't able to get there. So the challenges that face us with our fresh waters are very similar to those that Jan Wright spoke about in her talk yesterday. It's all about habitat, and we do a whole lot of things, which is, uh, impacts on our habitat. And invasive species, just like on the land, we have invasive plants and fish, uh, and things like the koi carp shown here, and, and invasive oxygen weeds, together with increased contaminants. Have, they act as a, as a nasty little trio that have resulted in a lot of places like our lowland lakes in the, in the lower Waikato, which until about the 1980s were vegetated and clear, have flipped to being devegetated and really quite eutrophic and dirty. Um, and on top of that, we have legacies from these contaminants, uh, both in groundwaters, but also legacies that build up in, st in stream banks and in the beds of lakes. So we've got some big challenges to deal with here, and on top, uh, finally on top of those things is what's coming with climate change, and I'll touch on some of these issues in this talk. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, connectivity and how important this is for native fish. 33% um, of, the, of the 50 native uh, fish we have in New Zealand, 28% of which are on the threatened list, uh, have a migratory phrase where they need to go from the sea to the fresh water. So connectivity is really important for these species. And if we just look at the Waikato as, a, as an example, you know, we've got over 15,000 row culverts. And when the regional council's gone out and looked at those, about half of them are barriers to fish passage. We've also got a lot of floodgates, which t t move about a quarter of the potential habitat for, for adult uh, whitebait are above those floodgates. And then we've got pumps and pumping stations, which have been working flat out over the last couple of months, and hydro dams which don't have any facility at the moment for, for dealing with downstream passage, particularly with our Tonga species, the eels, that are migrating at the moment, and those are getting chewed up by these floodgates currently. So we really got some, some, we need some new tools here to deal with that issue. There has a fish passage advisory group that's been developed between DOC and, and NIWA and the regional councils in the last few years that's working on these issues, but we've got some big challenges. Some of the things that have worked, you know, there are, for perch culverts, there have been some very simple solutions for some of our climbing species. We can actually put oyster mussel spat ropes down through culverts and, and the little fish can climb up through those. So some of the species do real well with those. Others that are the swimmers, uh, we need to, to, to look at other sort of interventions with putting um, spoilers and things through long culverts. And we've demonstrated that we can actually solve some of these fish passage problems with technologies we have, but we need to do more. We also need to figure out um, techniques that use the difference uh, in morphology and swimming patterns between our native species, which tend to be small and skinny, and some of the, the, the pests, so that we allow passage for the good stuff, but not the bad. Thinking about water availability, you know, we often say New Zealand has incredible water resources, and we do, but it, it varies very much in space and time. So we've got a, this, you know, looking at that California uh, map this morning, this is very similar. We've got a lot of water in places, particularly that are, where, where there's not many people. Where there's a lot of people and a lot of agriculture, we don't have a lot of water often. And, and it also varies temporarily. So we get a lot of drought, and we had droughts in, in um, Northland in the last summer. Uh, so while we, we do have a, a reasonable amount of water, it's not always where we want it. And we need to cater, of course, for the environmental flows and lake levels that are sustained, because obviously water and flow is a key part of sustaining habitat. And when we do that, we find that many of our catchments are near, at, or actually over the amount of water allocated that, that's allowable to maintain ecology. And if we look at future challenges, the, the climate change predictions shown here as the predicted changes in, in average flow by 2090 compared with 1990, we're expecting to see all those yellow and, and orangey areas. Uh, we've got between f lots of places where we'll have between 5 and 20% reduction in the mean flow by 2090. Uh, a lot of those are places where there's a lot of people and a lot of agriculture. On top of that, we're expecting to see more storminess and the hazards that that results in. And if you've been, your cyclones we've been through in the last uh, couple of months show what that can do. We, on top of that, we've got sea level rise of about a metre and a lot of our lowland areas where we've been farming peat, we're seeing the same sort of shrinkage that was described in, in California. 
So we're going to have real problems with coastal plain inundation in the next, um, next this century. We have increased population demand. Auckland has recently applied to more than double the amount of water that they can take out of the Waikato to sustain a million people in Auckland. There's a drive for more irrigation. And we have these cumulative effects from, of stuff in the past that has accumulated in our groundwaters, some of the legacies I described earlier in our, in our lakes as well. And biosecurity is going to go, going to go away with, with increasing travel with tourism, people being able to buy stuff over the internet and get it sent to them, and migrant populations coming who have a different culture with how they interact with water and what sort of species want to see there. So we really can't keep our eye off the ball on biosecurity. So just looking at some of the uh, crazy ambitious goals that, that I suggest for this challenge, uh, the first one is about linking biological heritage to the value chain idea which has become a core of the uh, our land and water national science challenge. So what that challenge is doing is trying to think about who in the world will pay for products that uh, pay a premium on products that have got a good food safety, good quality of food, land, water and animal welfare with an authentic New Zealand brand. So why don't we bring biodiversity metrics more into the heart of that? Because I'm sure people will pay for that as well. So this could be an economic driver for bioheritage that would provide for, for more restoration on uh, private land and hopefully get a virtuous circle going in that regard. The second major thing I'd suggest we should try and do is to align biological heritage goals with what we know is going to happen with climate change, some mitigation, and um, what we need to do to deal with our greenhouse gas um, emission requirements. And also linking up with the limit setting process that's going on around water quality goals. So if we think about um, the Deep South and, and our land and water, they've got a program going looking at what future climate change is going to do for productive systems. So there's a platform there that the challenge could link into to look at what's going to happen to our fresh water systems and, and other parts of bioheritage. Similarly, with the resilience to nat nature's challenges is looking at some of the hazards associated with climate change. And there's linkages there as well. So you know, should we be prioritising the reforestation we do for greenhouse gas mitigation to places where we're expecting increased storminess and more erosion to try and reduce the, the drive that has on for aquatic ecosystems. Thank you. And thinking about the lowlands, is it time to think about retreating from some of these places where it's inevitably going to be difficult to maintain agriculture and create, turn them into wetlands? We need to think about our apparent buffers as to broadening the focus of those from water quality control to things we can do to deal with what climate change is going to do to stream temperature by shading those streams. We know we can reduce stream temperature by about five degrees if we shade them, and other things there. So just finishing with some cracks of light, some examples I've been involved with in the last decade or two. Um, in the Fodder Fodder Sustainable Land Project, we looked at some land between Hamilton and Waikato Hill Country, which was uh, returning 2% on capital and, and exporting a lot of contaminants. Looked at better managing of linking of, of land use to land use capability and to come up with a farm system there which has had a number of benefits uh, from terrestrial and aquatic biodiversity and water quality benefits, although it hasn't solved the nitrate problem, partly due to changing back baselines and because the shade we've, we've provided has reduced in-stream uptake of nitrogen. The Te Awaro Waitau project in Tauranga with the Landcare Trust and the Regional Council there um, started out with an iwi group. They spread the word after showing some demonstration of them doing repairing management got the whole community involved. They've fenced 80% of the stream in that catchment over a 10 year period. We're now seeing improvements in, in water quality um, and, and improvements in catchment co cohesion. There's, we did some social science and have seen the community get more natural capital by people being involved. Rivers can act as ways of bringing people together. So I'll just um, conclude there. Our freshwaters are invaluable, but a lot of them are under increasing pressure. We have got some good things happening with limit setting and some restoration efforts underway. But, and some things are improving, but we've got a long way to go with others. What I think we need to do in particular is to get more big scale linked up thinking to across bioheritage and our water quality and climate change goals. So I'll just leave it there, thank you.